Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last panel of this conference, and we will have two presentations. Uh, the first one uh, will be made by the mover of the project, Professor Ye Wenxin, and she's going to talk about the Quiet Revolution, the writing of the history of Taiwan, to be followed by Tim Weston's reporting the other side, the expansion and pluralization of journalistic coverage across the Taiwan Strait. And because our discussant, Xin Yu Tian, is not present, his comments will be read by Professor Robert Weller. And despite that, we all owe our thanks to um, Professor Ye for this great conference. She's going to have uh, 20 minutes as everyone else. <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, my apologies um, to all of all of you, including myself. That is, we had uh, to um, impose such a uh, time constraint. Now, my topic uh, is about the writing of the history of Taiwan. And before getting started into the subject itself, let me explain the broader thinking behind the project. Namely, it's of course notable that Taiwan over the course of the past 60 years has gone through tremendous political transformation. And then this whole process of democratization has been referred to as a quiet revolution. Now, for historians, anytime the word his, uh, revolution is used, our first instinct is to go after the connections between ideas and practice. I think we had been trained by historians working on the French Revolution to look for connections between enlightenment and revolution. So these days, the way that we frame our questions tends to be that whether it's a organized body of ideas inspiring practice and leading on to political changes. Or, if we take Gramsci seriously, it's the other way around. Namely, it's a set of practice and the way that people interact. It's action that's providing the basis for the production of knowledge as well as self-understanding. So ultimately, my question or my interest on Taiwan's transformation has a lot to do with the whole issue of connections between people who do the thinking and people who do the acting. Or if the thinker and the actor happen to be one, all the better. So, uh, of course, this entire field of knowledge is broad and is complicated. Hence, to get things started, I thought I'd begin with the whole question of the production of the history of Taiwan as a key ingredient in this arena of knowledge production with regard to Taiwan's self-understanding. And then once we get started on that issue, of course, the natural question becomes, what happened with regard to major shifts in self-understanding, and what might be the connections between knowledge production and political action. So uh, to get back to that point, the starting point, the benchmark had to be Taiwan in the 1950s and the kind of history of Taiwan that was taught um, in schools when I was growing up, for instance, in elementary or secondary schools. So the backdrop in those days was unquestionably the Cold War. And then there were all sets of cultural institutions helping to propagate ideas. Textbooks, museums, libraries, um, uh, what, well, you name it, archives, all these other institutions. And then the basic line of understanding, which was a history of Taiwan written under the leadership of, <laughs> I won't say anything else, the, uh, the, uh, the Central Committee, perhaps, of the uh, Chinese Nationalist Party, would be something that 
characteristically would refer to Taiwan as say Taiwan is China's largest island. That's a very char characteristic way of uh, beginning the conversation. And then the history of Taiwan tends to be seen as a history of the expansion and construction of a new national living space by the sons and daughters of the Chinese people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the significance, the highlights of the history of Taiwan uh, would simply have to be the moment that Taiwan becomes Chinese or Taiwan as a place. Um, having any connection, building any connection with the history of China. Hence, Zheng Chenggong unquestionably has to be the person who launches the history of Taiwan. That entire narrative, which we could appropriately refer to as being Sino-centric or continental perspective, comes under attack in the 1970s. And this has a lot to do with the international situation that Taiwan confronted in the 1970s. In other words, there was a crisis in governance as well as a crisis in legitimacy that the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek had to face up to, thanks to the uh, Taiwan's um, ousting from the United Nations and then also the derecognization of the Republic of China by the United States in 1979. Now, so the interesting situation after afterwards was something like this. And I am quoting Zheng Qinren, who was uh, an interesting person, um, uh, who uh, produced uh, lectures with themes such as this. The end of imperial China's colonial rule of Taiwan ushered in under the trusteeship of international powers, the island's occupation by a fascist regime in the cloak of fatherland. This regime exercised colonial control under a facade of democracy. In addition, it implicated Taiwan in the civil war on China and brought massacre to the Taiwanese people. I mean, we don't have to carry on, but this is a familiar line, I believe, to uh, many of you. Zheng's fr frustration with the Jiang regime had a lot to do with his own experience in the 1970s and 1980s as a student studying in Tokyo, carrying the passport of the People's Republic of China and being told by the Japanese foreign ministry that there is no such a nation recognized by the United Nations anywhere that this Japanese official could find in his uh, manual or his, his, um, his book. So Zheng's frustration then finds expression in complaints such as what kind of a nation or what kind of a state is this if no one recognizes its flag, its national anthem, or its national name other than within this uh, domain that's completely under its control. So for Zheng Qinren, the people of Taiwan had been robbed of their historical memories and national representation. And it was necessary for the people of Taiwan, as they regain their own subject position, that they take matters into their own hands and they fashion their own consciousness, they assert their sovereign position. So out of this was Zheng Qinren's representation or construction of the contrast or the dichotomy between two entities. One is called traditional China, and the other thing is called modern Taiwan. Traditional China is simply traditional China out there. This is traditional China that had been governed under, uh, by a, a, a set of mentality associated uh, with a tributary system. And thanks to this tributary system, this is traditional China that insists on ideas either of zhengtong, political legitimacy, or the notion of unification. Modern Taiwan, according to Professor Zheng, would simply have to be completely different. Now, I won't elaborate on the details of uh, the, uh, either one of these positions. Um, except to say that uh, Professor Zheng's assertion or insistence on the importance of this subject position of the people of Taiwan 
in the writing or in making sense of their own historical memories, launch this entire historical trajectory. And then in the end, uh, towards the 1980s and especially into the 1990s, when history of Taiwan becomes a flourishing field within Taiwan's academia, that it launches this entire maritime paradigm as opposed to the continental paradigm in studies of Taiwan. This maritime paradigm, of course, begins by rejecting the whole notion about Taiwan being the largest island of China. Taiwan, yes, it is an island, but it's an island that's at the center of its own universe. It's also simply along with China, it's the center of gravity of concentric circles. And this is a whole set of concentric circles that would reach out into the Northeast Asian maritime world, the Southeast Asian maritime world, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, etc. It would feature people like the Dutch, the Spanish, and everybody else, including the Japanese and the Chinese as actors, but certainly not exclusively the Chinese as historical actors. In other words, it represents a set of aspirations that, uh, that takes into account the non-Chinese-ness or the non-Chinese reach and dimensions of Ch Taiwan's historical past. It wishes simply to critique the whole assertion that Taiwan was naturally Chinese. So with the maritime perspective, we have a different kind of positioning of self or the self positioning of Taiwan in coming out of that a maritime construction of the history of Taiwan that simply that raises questions about two things. One, the Chineseness of Taiwan, and secondly, the nature of its or the normative uh, expectation about the nature of its political culture growing out of its history as well as its present-day reality. So um, with all of these as the backdrop, um, or with the maritime as, as opposed to the continental paradigms uh, informing the backdrop of the conversations, academic historians began um, uh, launch their research on various aspects of the history of Taiwan. And by the 1990s, you would say it's, they produced, they succeeded in producing shelf after shelf of books in the libraries. And then in, within the uh, first decade of the 21st century, they also succeeded in re reorganizing museum display, archival classification of all sorts of things um, on historical subjects relating to Taiwan. Broadly speaking, the uh, emerging consensus there with regard to this version of the history of Taiwan was simply that from Zheng Chenggong all the way down to the 1950s, the history of Taiwan should be centered upon the people of Taiwan and their own historical experience as opposed to the experience of their colonizers or their colonial rulers. And secondly, the history of Taiwan ought to adopt the kind of historical perspective that's centered on the island itself rather than about the island being an adjunct piece to the continent of China. The um, Thematically, it seems to me that they essentially wish to ask two questions. One, what might be the nature of political ties between Taiwan and China? And then the other question is what might one might expect in terms of the natural economic connections between Taiwan and China. And then there, of course, with regard to the whole question of natural economic ties between Taiwan and China, there were at least two different paradigms. One paradigm would focus attention on Taiwan being a part of China under the Qing Hence, there were all kinds of natural connections, and the Taiwan, Strait of Taiwan was a very busy water 
connecting trade people, migrants on both sides. And then in a different paradigm would simply um, uh, draw attention to Japan and the Japanese empire or the trading relationship between Taiwan and uh, China during the period of uh, Japanese occupation. The combination of these uh, two perspectives, uh, two perspectives very often lead to the um, uh, new questions about the political economy with regard to trade and political connections between the two sides um, of, uh, of uh, the Taiwan Strait. Now, um, I don't think it's necessary for me to uh, get into to get into the details of any of the of uh, of this uh, reconstruction of the history of Taiwan, except to say that, by and large, um, this this is the kind of historical writing that has engaged the passion, the commitment, and fully utilized the kind of American trained historical. Uh, school, um, American certified historical training that many of the authors of uh, uh, the new history of Taiwan had received. So this, of course, is the sort of history that puts an end to the old paradigm, the continental paradigm um, of the history of Taiwan that was propagated uh, promulgated under the nationalist government in the mid-20th century. And this is also the kind of history of Taiwan that proves itself to be unacceptable to a third school of historical writing about Taiwan, which, um, which is based in places such as, say, Institute or College of Taiwan Studies in Xiamen, in Shanghai, various places um, on the Chinese continent. Now, again, I won't go into details um, in that regard, except, um, except to uh, simply to draw attention uh, to this three-way competition. Namely, there was the old nationalist line in its representation of the history of Taiwan, which was important in the mid-19th um, mid century. There is this dynamic and emerging maritime perspective, which by and large has swept across the entire field of history of Taiwan in Taiwan today. And there is also the third position of an approach to the history of Taiwan, which has been developed on the Chinese um, mainland. Now, of course, with all of that, I don't really have much of a conclusion to offer, except to say that along with Dr. Suchi, I would agree that there is virtually no topic in the history of Taiwan that does not become politicized. And there is virtually no, um, no topic in the writing of the history of Taiwan that does not have some sort of, of a, a partisan position or partisan-inspired interpretation of that history. Now, as for where, uh, where we go with this kind of historical understanding or how this set of historical understanding might contribute to policy making um, in, um, um, as people seek to envision the future of, um, of um, relationship between Taiwan and China, I think the way that Dr. Su puts it yesterday was that there is the heart and there is the head. The history of Taiwan uh, gains its momentum, draws its energy from the heart. Very often, it's about an effort to close that gap between personal memories, uh, individual histories, um, lived experiences that speaks directly to the heart. And it's not necessarily the construction that would directly, that would, that would, that would uh, necessarily, in, um, what, as a first instinct, appeal to the calculation of the head. But then, of course, perhaps it's precisely because of that or against a backdrop like that, that the writing of history of Taiwan has been practiced by the people who are proponents of 
both of Taiwan democracy and of Taiwan independence, that it's exactly because of that perceived or understood or understated discrepancy between the head and the heart that this school of writing, I find, to be to making it particularly interesting and compelling. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And then, Tim? Okay, thank you. Um, I want to uh, start by saying that um, my, my main area of research these days is Republican era Chinese uh, newspapers and journalism. Um, and I, I'm interested in those in that topic because I'm very interested in um, knowledge creation. Dis, uh, knowledge dissemination uh, and and public discourse, um, and uh, I was invited to be part of this project um, several years back. I'm very grateful for that, and I've I've learned a great deal along the way. Uh, in fact, uh, I would have to say that my own um, experience of Mobile Horizons has been the mobility of my own thinking, um, uh, owing to the uh, the insights uh, and help that I've received. Uh, along the way in conceiving uh, what it is I'm actually trying to do and I'm interested in here. Um, and um, <clears throat> that's reflected uh, first and foremost in the fact that my title has changed. Um, the one that uh, uh, is on the program is no longer the one I'm using. Um, the title that is there is Reporting the Other Side, the Expansion and Pluralization of Journalistic Coverage Across the Taiwan Strait. <clears throat> Um, I, I've given that up, and I've uh, adopted uh, instead the title, The Taiwan Taiwanese Newspaper Press in the People's Republic of China, A Survey of Connections Across Time. Uh, and I want to say a little bit uh, about why I've changed the, ti uh, the title and what that means about the way I'm thinking about uh, this, this work. Um, and again, I, I just want to emphasize uh, or to take the opportunity to thank uh, all the people who are participating uh, in this uh, several-year project with me for uh, very useful thoughts um, uh, along the way that have, have helped uh, help me clarify. <clears throat> um, first of all, I'm no longer looking at this uh, subject comparatively. Um, it seemed to be too much to do. Originally, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to look at the way in which uh, Taiwan was reported on uh, in the PRC, primarily newspaper, press, and uh, uh, vice versa, how uh, the, the PRC was reported on in the Taiwanese newspaper press. Uh, just too much to try and do in a, uh, a project of this sort. Uh, but also, uh, it became less and less compelling for me to try and talk about uh, the way in which Taiwan is represented in the, uh, in the PRC press, uh, and increasingly compelling for me to think about uh, the Taiwan side of the story. So uh, what I've really done is move from a comparative approach to adopting uh, pretty much a Taiwan-focused uh, approach to this project. <clears throat> Um, and I find, uh, of the two cases, uh, studying the, the historical evolution of the way in which uh, Taiwanese newspaper industry um, uh, deals with or has, has been impacted by, in various ways, um, the presence of China and the existential threat that it poses to uh, Taiwan, uh, is a more, there's, there's a more dynamic and changing story to look at there than there is if one is looking at this uh, from the other side of, uh, from the other shore. Um, furthermore, uh, I'm not really looking any more centrally at reporting itself. Um, I'm interested in that, but that's only a piece of what I'm interested in. Um, I'm looking uh, more uh, at a vari the variety of ways that Taiwanese uh, newspaper industry uh, as a whole and the environment uh, in Taiwan has reflected the, pe uh, the People's Republic of China, um, uh, reported on the People's Republic of China and been Im impacted by it since 1949. In other words, I have found that studying Taiwanese uh, newspaper coverage of the PRC forced me to read and think about a range of issues having to do with how those newspapers operated uh, within Taiwanese society, uh, and those questions became more interesting to me as a subject than the question of coverage of the PRC alone. Uh, and I, I guess it's, it's been another exercise for me in the discovery of the, the point that 
that is often made, which is studying texts is great, but you need to study texts in the broader context in which they're created. I'm very interested in, therefore, the social history, the political history, and sort of the business history that surrounds um, uh, newspapers and the newspaper industry um, in, in Taiwan. <clears throat> so uh, as a historian, um, Micah said we're interested in details. Yeah, I, we're interested in details, but we're, of course, also interested in uh, change over time. Um, and um, that's the approach I've adopted. It's similar to the one that Michael Sony just uh, mentioned and that he's, he's divided his, uh, his, approach, his chapter into sort of three different historical periods, I think he said. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to do the same. I, I've done something very similar, uh, organizing my thoughts into three main sections. Um, the martial law period, 49 to 87, um, what I'm referring to as the post-martial law uh, period, um, 1988 to 2008, and then the third period uh, being what I'm referring to as the contemporary or the Mainjo uh, period uh, uh, in Taiwanese history. And in this paper, I'm trying to give roughly equal space to each of those three different periods, which means, uh, relatively speaking, I'm spending a lot more time on the two years of the, la the last two years than I am on uh, the, the, the bigger chunks uh, of time before, uh, simply because I want to e give them uh, uh, equal weight. And I think the developments in the last two or three years have been uh, really quite uh, important and fascinating. And uh, by providing a, a historical backdrop um, through this study of first martial law period and then the post martial law period, I think uh, it's easier to appreciate just how much things have changed. <clears throat> OK. Uh, uh, one of the organizing ideas of my study is a very simple one. I think others have made uh, mention of it, namely that we cannot fully understand the history uh, or the evolution of the media in Taiwan in this case, uh, for me, the newspaper media, without properly appreciating the ways in which the People's Republic of China and the adversarial and tense relationship between Beijing and Taipei has shaped the development of post-1949 society um, as a whole. I think Dr. Su Chi made the same point yesterday when he talked about the cross-strait relationship being in insinuated into virtually everything uh, and how it was when he was the head of the Mainland Affairs Council, uh, he could never rest. Um, he, he had to answer to uh, all kinds of questions because uh, there's not really any question that doesn't in some way uh, uh, touch on that. So I'd like to offer just some examples from each of the sections into which I've divided the paper. Um, saving um, some more time for the last section, which is the contemporary period, which those of you who have gotten the paper know I have actually haven't even put into writing yet, uh, for which my apologies. Um, so let me just say a few things about the martial law periods. Uh, this is uh, history that many of you, uh, I am sure, are very familiar with. Um, this is 49 to 87. Um, and I see the way in which the entire newspaper industry in Taiwan was constructed under the, under the uh, dictatorship as being very, very directly related to um, the, the rivalry with, uh, the, with the Communist Party and, um, and China. Uh, 1951 uh, is passed the, the publications law, the Chuban Fa, uh, in which uh, is imposed um, uh, a series of uh, uh, highly restrictive uh, measures that control uh, how many newspapers could be published, how long they could be, uh, uh, who could publish them, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, fundamentally limiting um, the, and, and controlling the, the kind of discourse uh, in newspapers that could take place. Um, there, were, uh, the, there was a combination of directly state-run papers, party-run papers, military-run papers, and then a few private papers, the two most uh, uh, important of those uh, being Lian He Bao, or United Daily News, and Zhongguo Shi Bao, uh, or China Times, which um, I think can be described as uh, existing in a, in a patron-client relationship uh, with, the, with the Nationalist Party state. Um, in these newspapers, uh, virtually all of them, um, the, what was said about the PRC was highly limited, um, and uh, there was not a great deal of attention paid. What was said was highly propagandistic, highly predictable, uh, and almost uniformly negative. Uh, the People's Republic of China, I, I think we can say, did not really emerge as a real place uh, in the Taiwanese newspaper press. It, it was instead a two-dimensional uh, 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 caricature of a, a real place uh, with complex uh, uh, developments taking place. <clears throat> 
Um, so it's fair to say that during the martial law period, uh, the newspaper industry and journalistic practice, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the People's Republic, was shaped profoundly by the ongoing Cold War uh, between, uh, between uh, the communists and the nationalists. And the party state's insistence that the media in Taiwan had to be marshaled to the purpose of prosecuting the Cold War, uh, uh, the cold phase of the, the Civil War. Uh, that phase, of course, begins to break down even after the, uh, even before, I should say, the Guomindang gives up its monopoly on political power in the late 1980s, owing to the rapid and phenomenal changes taking place after Mao, uh, Mao's death. Uh, the dynamic changes in the People's Republic created demand for more knowledge about uh, the People's Republic of China in Taiwan. Uh, and we do see some changes in the press, but by and large, uh, the, the People's Republic still is uh, pretty two-dimensional, uh, uh, not much uh, nuance, and, nor is there even a great deal of information about, uh, about China uh, in the press. This really begins to change uh, only uh, in 1987, 88. Uh, with uh, the end of martial law, permission uh, for people to, uh, Taiwanese to travel to the mainland to visit with family members, uh, and, and the, by this time nearly a decade into the, uh, the re reform and opening up era, the great changes taking place in China, uh, creating this huge demand uh, for uh, information about uh, China that did not exist before, creating uh, in, in the Taiwanese newspaper industry, in the media in general, but I'm focusing on the newspaper industry, what was referred to as a da lu re, um, a, a real craze for news and information about the mainland. Uh, in this period, we see, uh, and then with the end of martial law, uh, and the, uh, we also see the end of the, uh, the highly censorious, restrictive uh, press laws uh, and the freeing up of the press, uh, leading to an explosion in the number of uh, newspapers uh, and other media or, uh, organs. Um, and we see, and, and the organization now of these along uh, commercial lines. Uh, it's now a commercialized press in which you have a real possibility of um, uh, competing in a, in a marketplace rather than being wholly controlled by the political forces of the party state. Uh, and I think what's interesting to me about this period of time, there are a number of things that could be said, and I'll just to talk about one or two, um, is that I think in this period of time we see China moving from being a restricted subject and a subject that could only be discussed in particular ways because of the political uh, controls to one in which uh, the PRC was now a, uh, a subject that could be discussed and was discussed uh, in order to sell newspapers. It became profitable to talk about the PRC. Uh, there was a demand for this information and this changed the way in which uh, newspapers uh, positioned themselves to talk about China. They talked about all sorts of things that they knew people wanted to know that were useful information, that was information that was uh, going to be, get people to part with their money and buy those newspapers. Um, news about, the, uh, about China in the 19, uh, late 80s and then 90s, um, all the way to the present really, um, has been then considerably uh, greater in quantity uh, it has been greater in type, uh, and uh, we see all sort the PRC now reflected in Taiwanese newspapers uh, certainly as a real place with uh, all sorts of layers and, and, and aspects to it. Um, we see, too, um, that, uh, and this is something that I find interesting to note, that most PRC scholars who I've read on this subject would say that the news has become far more objective. It's no longer all um, negative news by a long shot. Uh, we see uh, China being treated in many respects like uh, any other part of the world, uh, a place that uh, has um, uh, positive and negative features and, and complexity. At the same time, and I can only touch on this briefly, but in the paper I try and do it more justice, owing to uh, changes that Shelley and others have talked about in terms of internal uh, Taiwanese uh, politics, identity politics, we see with the rise of the native Taiwanese movement uh, uh, and sort of delling of that in the, uh, in the 1990s, um, the development of a, a whole different kind of press uh, in Taiwan, the press of the, uh, of the of the of the Bendi Ren of the of the uh, nativist movement, um, uh, this is most clearly signified by Zio um, Shibao or Liberty Times, which joins Lian Hebao and Zhongguo Shibao to be one of the top. To those become then the three major newspapers uh, in China. Uh, I'm sorry, in Taiwan, 
Uh, and they, of course, Zio Shibao has a very, very different uh, attitude towards China uh, than do the other two. Uh, it uh, tends still, still to adhere to a more kind of restricted and highly politicized uh, position on China as compared uh, to the other two, although uh, politics are there in all cases, of course. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so let me just turn now to the third section of the paper. Um, that is the Mayan-Zhou period. Uh, when we look at this period, we see the extraordinary degree to which things have and are changing. Whereas in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and most of the 80s, the PRC was not a subject of serious news reporting in the Taiwanese press. Uh, and in the 90s and first decade of the 21st century, China was presented in a refracted journalistic light um, uh, and was a subject that was used, uh, among other things, to sell newspapers. Uh, since the election of Ma Ying zhou in 2008 um, and his government's rapprochement with Beijing, which we've been talking about, we see a very different uh, set of questions coming to the fore. Uh, in a word, there's substantial anxiety, and I just discovered this clearly in January when I was in Taipei uh, and conducted some interviews um, and found uh, I didn't expect this, but what I came out of there uh, realizing was that the new narrative is one of crisis. Uh, there's a sense of uh, the Taiwanese media being under siege. It may just have been the people I talk to, and it may just be the things I'm searching for when I do uh, my research, but there's plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, information out there for the, that lends itself to this, this narrative. Uh, crisis, why? Uh, anxiety about what? Well, namely that um, the PRC is using its vast economic and political muscle to take advantage of Taiwan's uh, open system for the purpose of infiltrating the Taiwanese media, uh, and that in so doing, it is distorting the workings of the Taiwanese media. Again, I'm looking at newspapers, but this goes across the media spectrum, uh, and threatening its uh, hard-won freedom and its ability to treat the PRC, among other things, in an objective fashion. Um, this uh, anxiety is apparent uh, over a variety of issues and has been expressed most clearly uh, by academics who study communications and media, uh, and also by uh, journalists themselves. Um, let me just say a few things uh, about uh, some of the specifics. Um, concern that Taiwanese newspapers um, wanting into the Chinese market, into the market on the continent um, as media enterprises or as some part of their uh, investments, they want into China, um, and in order to do so, they are being increasingly cautious about how they report on China, saying uh, less and less uh, that might be dis displeasing to, and I'm not sure who. <laughs> uh, it could be the Beijing government. It could be business interests. It could be provincial uh, uh, interests, provincial political leaders, but that they are becoming more cautious. Um, secondly, the, me the Taiwanese media companies are um, invested in the PRC economy in a variety of different ways. They don't only just want in as media organizations. They want in to buy property, to buy, um, uh, to invest in, in industry, and so on and so forth. And this is having the same effect. What is making them uh, is, is making them more cautious, more reluctant to uh, be critical uh, of, of things in China. Going the other way, there's an increasing uh, concern and, and discourse about the way in which the uh, Pe People's Republic of China interests are buying into the uh, media market, uh, investing in it in Taiwan. Uh, and there's uh, very clear uh, indications that uh, there's a considerable amount of uh, mainland money now in Zhongguo Shibao uh, and in Nianhebao uh, and these conglomerates. Um, and there's suspicion that this money is uh, leading to a different kind of uh, orientation on the page vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, Another way, uh, and one could go on, but another way is that Taiwanese newspapers are increasingly relying on advertising from China, um, even though it's actually illegal still, uh, as I understand it, for uh, Taiwanese newspapers to run ads from PRC. Um, and I'm not sure if this is just political ads or it's all ads, but I think it's all ads. Um, uh, all the newspapers are doing it except for uh, Apple Daily. Um, all of them are doing it because uh, even though they face the potential of fines from um, uh, uh, authorities in Taiwan, uh, the fines are going to cost them less than the profits they make, and therefore it's a calculated decision. We're going to do this anyway. It's just a matter of time before this relic law uh, goes by the wayside uh, and 
so what we're seeing then is that the Taiwanese newspapers are and television stations uh, are becoming more and more reliant on advertising dollar uh, not dollars uh, advertising money coming from China. Uh, and this is another reason, then, that they are becoming cautious. An, a, a twist on this issue of advertising is the whole question of what's called embedded advertising. So it's not just advertising where you're advertising, clearly this isn't an advertisement, but also um, news stories or uh, in the guise of news stories that are, in fact, essentially propaganda pieces for provincial governments, for uh, typically uh, uh, for interests in China, which are trying to uh, create uh, sympathy and interest in investing uh, uh, in, in uh, the Taiwan, uh, sorry, the mainland uh, economy. Um, so all, for all of these reasons, uh, and there are others that I haven't mentioned, there is this growing sense among specialists uh, people who watch the media and are, are, are concerned about this, that things have changed and they're changing fast and it's getting dangerous. Um, the, uh, the, the basic concern is with not censorship but self-censorship, okay? That we've moved out of an environment in which the KMT party state uh, imposed censorship, uh, moved uh, through a period of time in which uh, it was pretty rough and tumble, uh, and we're now in a period of time uh, that uh, increasingly there's self-censorship uh, taking place, uh, bec uh, or what many of them will refer to as the Hong, Kongiza Hong Kongization of the Taiwanese uh, press, that it's becoming, uh, that it's so integrated that through ECFA and all of the other uh, things that we've been talking about here for the last few days, uh, becoming uh, increasingly undesirable. Uh, for there to be a, a, a really independent, uh, uh, critical voice within um, much of the leading Taiwanese newspaper media vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China. <clears throat> okay. Um, and, and I want to I emphasize that the language I'm reading about this is dire. Um, there are people who are talking about the end of a free press in Taiwan or a seriously compromised free press in Taiwan. And the people who are speaking about this, by the way, are not only Taiwanese intellectuals. Uh, also, they are international uh, media watchdog groups like Freedom House, which is based in New York City, uh, the Committee to Pre Protect Journalists, which is also based in New York City. Uh, Taiwan's rankings in terms of press freedom uh, have been dropping uh, uh, clearly in these international lists in the last several years. Not to the low, low levels, certainly not. But a few years ago, Taiwan was, uh, this was one of the great claims of uh, success of the Taiwanese political reform era. Uh, and uh, now there's a real feeling among many, including people, international observers, that this is, uh, this is being um, seriously compromised. Um, Okie doke. Um, then I want to add one other piece to this, just to tie it more clearly to the Mayanjo um, uh, government. Um, this is not just happening because of uh, business integration and uh, investment. Uh, it's also happening, so the critics say, because um, the Mayanjo government uh, is uh, also cautious, also has an interest in playing down controversial uh, information or sub, uh, discussion in the press about China. Um, uh, this I have. This is a complicated question, and it's very hard for me to figure out uh, how to study it exactly. But several people with whom I spoke in, in Taiwan said that there's this feeling that the Ma government, uh, since it's been in, in office, has been. Uh, very, very inaccessible to the press, uh, trying to uh, limit uh, press access uh, and that it's uh, worse than it was uh, uh, before his government for sure. Somebody uh, there said, com compared it to the Bush administration in this country and how things changed very dramatically when George Bush uh, came uh, into office uh, and that the, the government became much less interested in really speaking openly and freely and exchanging information with the press. Um, uh, another way it was explained is that the Ma government, Ma, Ma Yin-jeou, wants to be reelected. Uh, he is clearly uh, pushing the line with uh, a, a, a large percentage of the electorate in, uh, uh, in Taiwan in terms of um, his willingness to be closer to China. Uh, and this is um, uh, creating great anxiety. The best uh, thing to do is to f uh, tamp down the really controversial stories about China and to uh, uh, emphasize business commercial ties because these, this is uh, where the, the advantage to him seems to be coming in. 
uh, I want to just uh, finish with a few other remarks. Um, so uh, what we're seeing then is the changes over time are, are, are really quite extraordinary. We go from a period of time when uh, China could barely uh, get a, you could barely talk seriously about China in the in the press in Taiwan to a period where there's real anxiety that the the PRC is somehow infiltrating and uh, undermining a free Taiwanese press. Uh, this is a this is a, a sea change uh, in a several decade period of time. Um, and I guess what I would I would say here, my conclusions are are not written yet, in part because I don't know what they fully are. But in part, um, what I, I would say is that uh, the other key thing I'm thinking about here, uh, and this also goes to some of the things that Dr. Suchi was saying yesterday, uh, is the unpredictability. Uh, the media is a business. It operates on a profit motive. Uh, it doesn't operate purely on a profit motive in Taiwan because uh, there are. Uh, nor does it in many places, but it is um, it is uh, something that uh, is um, driven by desire to sell. Um, and we get to this this question then whether or not the logic of trying to sell newspapers or 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 to invest in China uh, is driving um, media coverage uh, versus the the kind of uh, uh, political um, uh, considerations of the first. Um, in the first 30, 40 years uh, of, of Taiwan's history. So I guess what I would say here is that uh, there are competing logics at work here um, that are uh, forcing these issues. It's not merely um, uh, PRC, uh, insidious PRC behavior, as many of the, those would claim uh, in Taiwan. It's also that um, uh, it goes back to the question of identity or homo uh, economists uh, and uh, what is it that is most important here. And I think uh, in many respects it's a logical head-based decision uh, to uh, be more careful and prudent uh, in the way in which you cover uh, the mainland when you are becoming increasingly uh, uh, tied at the hip uh, to, to the mainland. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And Professor Abouvera? So I know it looks like I'm the discussant, and the discussant, in fact, will look just like me, but it isn't me. <laughs> it, it is actually Xin Yotian, who's the one listed on the program. She had a family issue, and she couldn't make it, but she sent written remarks, and I'm simply drafted to channel them to you. Um, so let, I'm reading with not much familiarity off the computer screen here, so forgive the... the uh, hesitations and errors. They're all mine, not hers. So this is, this is now Xing Yotian. <laughs> My discussion today will focus on an old yet highly relevant question of bipolar analysis and the ways the two authors, Wan Xin and Tim, have tried to break it. As clearly presented in Wan Xin and Tim's papers, in the discussion and writing about the cross-straits relationship, most contemporary scholars, writers, journalists, politicians, and opinion leaders have been quite persistent in their framing of Taiwan-China relationships as a bipolar question. These are two places, two political camps. Within Taiwan, there are two opposing cultural reference points, Chinese Taiwan or Taiwanese Taiwan. When it comes to the question of the political future, we're presented with two opposing scenarios, unification or separation. History is therefore written within a framework of whether the two units have always been closely connected or separated geographically, socioculturally, economically, and politically. Even when Taiwan scholars and political leaders tried to desinicize, as Wen Xin has presented in her paper, using the example of Du Zhengsheng's exhibition in the Palace Museum, which presented Taiwan as being independently connected with the world, bypassing China, the Taiwan-China connectedness remains to be the source of inspiration for such exhibition. Another example can be found in the historical presentations of Zhang Chenggong, whose story was framed in such a bipolar way that the core question was whether Zhang Chenggong was an independence hero against the Qing regime in the mainland, or he had in fact negotiated with the Qing court and was willing to become a Qing subject, only unsuccessfully. Or, to use yet another example in Wenxin's paper about uprisings in the 18th and 19th century uh, in Taiwan's frontier society of migrants and settlers, 
the debates have been whether these were acts of anti-colonial independence movement against mainland rule, or they were more of a class-based struggle against the roaming people, yomin, um, against landlords and merchants, as happened frequently in late imperial, oops, China. <laughs> Hang on. More recently, this either-or framework has been reinforced by the political rivalry um, and has generated several paired concepts found in news reports and policy propaganda, as shown in Tim's paper, such as democratic Taiwan and authoritarian China, or traditional China and modern Taiwan, and Taiwan's presumed natural, in quotes again, impulse towards independence and China's toward unification. Both Wenxin and Tim have tried to break this overarching dichotomy and paired concepts in their papers. Although with different starting points in time, both historians showed that in different periods, actors in Taiwan and China had demonstrated not so coherent, often shifting ways of fashioning themselves, as well as in their relationship with one another. The two historians also diverge in their focus of critiquing the dichotomy. Wen Xin, by focusing on the writing of historians, questioned both Taiwan and China-based writers. Despite their opposing views of the relationship between the two places, they shared a fixed construction of Taiwan and Taiwanness, as well as China and Chineseness, which became the foundation of the debate on how Chinese is Ta on how Chinese is Taiwan and how Taiwanese is Taiwan. She went on to remind us of the very strong role of Japan that contributed to disturb the dichotomous relationship between Taiwan and China since the late 19th century, and the mixed and shifting sociocultural and political economic orientation in Taiwan's connection and disconnection with China and Chineseness, as well as Japan and Japaneseness. Tim, by focusing on newspaper journalism, outlined the ever-changing dynamism and diversifying positions of major newspapers in Taiwan in their reporting on China from the 1950s to the present. At the end, because of a complex set of calculations on both commercial and political grounds, we found the co-production and continuous competition among major opinion makers with diverse views on China. These internal inconsistent, this internal inconsistency and diversity, again, helps to break a singular Taiwan's view of China in the dichotomous division between Taiwan and China. Tim told us that the answer to the question of what is China for Taiwan and what do we do with the relationship depends on whom you talk to, under what circumstances, and at what time period. As always, inspiring writings provoke more questions than they have answered. Here are my questions, one for Wenxin, one for Tim. For Wenxin, I... Uh, sorry. Ah, for one, Xin, I wonder, in order to break the dichotomy further, could we identify a worthy, significant enough third or fourth camp of writers that cannot be easily grouped on the basis of their physical and social base of writing, either in Taiwan or China, or their political inclination, either pro or against unification? What could be the third or fourth competing narration in the historiography of the Taiwan-China relationship? For Tim, in order to place Taiwan's newspaper coverage on China beyond the dichotomy of Taiwan versus China, I wonder whether and how the formation and transformation of a global information network organized by both political and commercial interests have shaped your story. Of course, this question is about the internet, but it's not exclusively about the internet. It's also about the global trend of news agency restructuring and expansion and the increasingly close ties between partisan politics, financial capital, and media conglomerates. In other words, can we identify a source of inspiration outside of the Taiwan-China relationship, which plays a decisive role in this relationship? And she's finished. Uh, I'm me again. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Xin <laughs> Um <laughs> And uh, we would have about 12 minutes uh, to have um, questions and answers. I have a hand there. Yes. I have a question for uh, Wenxin, which is kind of building off of the comments made by Professor Xing slash Weller, uh, which is how do you situate the American scholarship in relation to the Chinese language scholarship 
on Taiwan history that you've described in the sense, and I'm thinking very specifically about the Zheng regime on Taiwan, which has undergone kind of a boom in, among American, specifically, interestingly, Chinese American grad students writing in the United States. I can think just off the top of my head of three dissertations about the Zheng regime. And so where do you situate that scholarship in relation to the, the scholarship that you have discussed in your paper? And then I have a question also for Tim, which relates to a, a different aspect of media coverage of the mainland on Taiwan, which is the kind of satirical dimension of the way in which the mainland gets discussed in the Taiwan media. I mean, I'm thinking about the talking panda bears and with the Beijing accents and what have you. Um, at what point does the mainland become a laughing matter in Taiwan? And is that a way of kind of veiling criticism through satire and parody and all those sorts of things. Do you think there's anything to that? Um, anyway, those are just the things that I that I was curious about. Um, another follow-up question for Tim to think about. Um, I think I, your discussion, obviously, of Ziyou Shibao and of Wang Bao is really interesting in terms of how there are significant shifts in uh, very widely distributed newspaper coverage of the mainland and how that's portrayed. I think another dimension of that that I've noticed in my own research is how mainland Chinese in Taiwan get portrayed by those newspapers. So the issue of mainland spouses, um, Ziyou Shibao is much more likely to pick up on salacious stories um, things that make mainland spouses look bad, that question their intentions and motives, et cetera. Not necessarily as uh, a political infiltration, but more as a social commentary. Um, this isn't to say that papers like China Times or Lian Hao Bao don't also cover those stories, but the, um, the tone and the emphasis in them, it, it, there's a pretty clear distinction between uh, the types of stories about the China within, so to speak. Um, and I'm wondering if that could be drawn out as well in thinking about um, comparisons uh, in how they portray the mainland more broadly. Any other questions? May I add one to Professor Ye Wenxin? Um, you talked about three schools, three camps. The first one is the continental paradigm, second maritime, um, paradigm. The third one, um, and you didn't specify it, basically that is uh, what people would say on the Chinese mainland today. So I'm wondering what is the difference in terms of the content between the first paradigm, that is the Kuomintang paradigm, about the history of Taiwan, and the third paradigm. Uh, they seem to be all based on a China-centered uh, interpretation of the Taiwan history. Thank you. So we would uh, like Professor Ye to respond first. And how much time uh, should I take? About, yeah, about uh, three, four minutes. Okay. <coughs> well, these are all terrific questions, and my thanks to uh, uh, everybody. Um, I, su I suppose I, I will save, um, um, well, let me start with Micah's question, namely, what do we make of uh, the representation of the Zheng regime in English language uh, um, scholarship emerging in recent days? Um, I suppose, I mean, uh, having served on, uh, chaired at least one of those dissertations, I would say there are maybe at least four, four reasons for it. Uh, for the first reason is simply that given the wealth of information or archival as well as historical information that has been generated on that period of time on the activities of the Zheng regime, thanks precisely to this cross-strait uh, contestation. That is, both Taipei and Xiamen have produced an abundance of information on this that um, 
it makes it easy for American students to write doctoral dissertations on this period. So uh, many people are attracted to it, first of all, simply by the romantic appeal of piracy. Pirates are very attractive topics. <laughs> and then, uh, so that's reason number one. And then num reason number two is also the attractiveness of that whole notion of maritime China and the attraction comes primarily for our graduate students. I'm not making fun of anybody, myself included. Uh, we are drawn to that that notion, to this to to this uh, romantic quality of an open-ended venture. That is uh, the it, the world. Well, the you are out there searching for the edge of the world, the end of the world, and you you follow a certain trajectory. So the Zheng regime offers that kind of opportunity because the source materials come in Japanese, in Dutch, in Portuguese, in Spanish, not to mention in Chinese. So um, those pub um, possibilities are there. And then, of course, on the continental end, we have the rise of the new Qing history, which essentially uh, reconstruct, uh, reconstructs late imperial China as a multi-ethnic continental Empire, even though it's uh, Turco Mongol in inspiration, nonetheless multi ethnic. And in some ways, the Zheng regime offers the opportunity for a parallel construction of the multi ethnic, open ended nature of the maritime East Asian Empire. So that's appeal number three. And appeal number four is the Zheng regime precisely because it was, it was the one. Uh, Chinese fleet that presumably drove the Dutch out of their fortified um, site in southern Taiwan, that this offered one instance of the power or the, the, the strength of the Chinese maritime fleet in, um, during the early phase of global um, capitalistic competition. So given the nature of interest in, say, early capitalism and 17th century global connections, that's yet another reason. So you could see that there are agendas out there which are connected, but not exactly. This is not part of the conversation about whether Taiwan should be a part of China or not. But certainly the kind of uh, dissertation that writes on the um, archival and historical research that has been done by people engaging in uh, those very intense discussions. And then I suppose, um, uh, coming back to Yushan about the question about uh, the difference between KMT and the CCP with regard to the cultural, the difference is there, it's a difference in cultural ideology. Um, my, I tend to see I tend to see the, the insurgent new Taiwan historiography as somewhat different from the historical representations of Taiwan, either by the KMT or by the CCP, for this one very uh, simple reason. Namely, the writing of the history of Taiwan by people on Taiwan about why Taiwan ought to be neither uh, nationalist nor communist is the writing of the history of Taiwan done by people who start out from a position of being repressed. And then they move from a position of being repressed to eventually, of course, ascendant, ascendancy and assertion of subjectivity. And ultimately, what I do hope not to see would be their reimposing their hegemonic position through uh, institutionalized cultural means on everybody else, saying that this is the orthodoxy you may only think my way or no way. I certainly hope that that doesn't get duplicated. Between the KMT and the CCP, and I think the, the, uh, there are differences in uh, historiography. The Marxian uh, materialistic base is one of those. But quite apart uh, from that, uh, the, the commonality there is also striking, namely putting emphasis on genealogy, on uh, issues of migration, on historical transmission as a transmission that could be embodied simply in genealogical records. So there are differences as well as similarities in uh, constructions of culture, 
as well as history. So the difference between these two camps, um, I think they share um, a lot in terms of basic cultural ideology, but they do differ from each other quite significantly in terms of their uh, historical ideology, their construction of uh, the moving or shaping forces in history. So those would be my two responses. And as for Yu Tian, let me think it over for, for one more second. The one point that I do wish to make is that I, I believe that um, the, the, the most helpful or the most dynamic kind of historical writing is the kind of historical writing done by people in search of self-understanding. In other words, it's not about um, observing or towing a historical line that has been distributed, disseminated by organized entities or um, centers of authority for purposes of standardization or unification in thinking. The far more compelling historical projects are projects undertaken by people in search of self-understanding. And it's also the kind of self-understanding that contains the ability to continue reflecting upon one's own historical circumstances. And, and would, you, would you also say that in resistance, maybe often in direct resistance to overarching narratives, which are restrictive of other possibilities? Right. But then, but then there are also possibilities of a dialogue, right? Conversations could be stimulating. Right. For without contestation, Without contestation, then there is no conversation, and a monologue is always far less interesting mm -hmm. than either a dialogue or even a debate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wrote uh, briefly to Xingyong Tian the other day uh, because I had given her so many late. <laughs> My paper came in so late, and then I changed it again. I felt I had better help her figure out what I'm trying to do. Uh, and I wrote her and said, um, I'm not writing about the internet. Um, uh, I'm not writing about uh, uh, transformations in the global um, information uh, network. And I knew she would still ask the question, because it's an absolutely reasonable and, and fair one. How do you link um, what I'm interested in to other media forms and to uh, media that is uh, not just uh, Taiwan uh, based, but is is clearly, in so many ways, being um, shaped by forces that are bigger than Taiwan. I, I have to admit, I'm really not prepared to talk very much about it. Um, I, I know it's something that needs to be looked at much more carefully. It's not been what I've been doing. Uh, I've just been grappling, trying to get my hands on around this topic. But I, I acknowledge it as an important topic and one that I will think more about uh, maybe for another iteration of this whole thing in another time, <clears throat> um, but probably not for this chapter. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the two questions I did receive uh, just now, one from Micah and one from Sarah, uh, Micah's question about uh, satirical portrayal of the PRC in, in the Taiwanese media. <clears throat> um, and it, might this be uh, a different form of uh, criticism of uh, the PRC than the more overt uh, type that you might find either in, on the editorial page or uh, through emphasis by a certain kind of coverage uh, on, in the news section? Very possibly, uh, yes, I think so. I, uh, uh, I, I think there are all sorts of ways in which this is more subtle than, than the, um, uh, you know, one can look at any single newspaper and, ha and, and probably talk about this for a long, long time and, and come at it from a variety of points of view. I guess what I'm trying to um, do is to filter out a ton, uh, all of the nuance and complexity and to boil it down into simple statements. Uh, and the simple statement being this, that I do detect um, uh, a, a real new uh, discourse of anxiety around the issues that I just spoke of. Uh, and I think that that's real. Um, whether or not the anxiety is well placed or not is a different question. I actually think it is. <laughs> I tend to believe it is. But um, that's, that's, that's more, uh, that, that's an aside. I think for the purposes of what I'm trying to do, I just want to identify that the PRC has emerged now at, uh, in terms of the way in which the press operates and thinks of itself and critics of the press and watchers of the press think of themselves as a boogeyman that is um, uh, distorting uh, the, the, the hard-won democratic um, freedoms um, of uh, 
that it, that it for so long lacked and finally gained after the end of martial law. So that, that's not a great answer, Micah. I think your, your question's great. I, I would love to look more carefully and do uh, smaller scale, um, up close studies to look at this. Again, it only can do so much. Um, and in terms of your question, Sarah, I, I think uh, it's, it's really um, suggestive. Um, I'd love to, if you could point to me uh, to some of these, I'd be grateful. Um, not that I think I can do a lot with them here. I, I'd like to acknowledge the point, though, in, in this chapter. I think it's an important one, that it's, that it's not just uh, China over there, but the China that has come here uh, and um, how that gets portrayed as well. Your, your question... Um, and really, if you if you have some suggestions, please do share them. But when you mentioned the Zio Shirbao as as being the place where the behavior of spouses tends not to be treated as generously, perhaps uh, as in other uh, sources, one of, it makes me think of uh, a comment that uh, somebody who works uh, for Zio Shirbao's English language Taipei Times said to me <laughs> uh, just in January. And this is a very thoughtful person. He said, if I were trying to understand the mainland, I would not read my newspaper. <laughs> uh, he said, my newspaper is so distorted in what it has to say about China that uh, it's not a good place to go to try and get information. And my guess would be that it, by extension, uh, that's true of the way in which uh, uh, PRC folks who are in Taiwan uh, are covered as well. But that's a, that's a kind of generalization. But, but they're so partial. Uh, they're so... Uh, partisan, I mean, um, and they're so um, kind of totalistic in their worldview that um, uh, I, I think that's something that needs to be needs to be acknowledged here. So, thank you. So this, conc this concludes the, uh, the the final panel, but we still have very important presentations and speeches and so on and so forth in the afternoon. So we wait for, you know, the leadership will announce just how many minutes we will have and when the, uh, the next on the program, the, the featured speech will, uh, will begin in the afternoon. Shall we, um, let's, we will aim to resume uh, 10 minutes after one right here. So for um, here we are, it's 12.15 right now. Let's take our lunch break and resume at 10 minutes after 1 here, on time. That is 10 minutes after 1. Thank you. Thank you.